Did you know that over half of Americans between the ages of 13 and 38 would choose to be an influencer if they had the chance? Another poll shows that kids are three times more likely to want to be a YouTuber than an astronaut. If you're one of those people, this video is for you. My name is JT, and I run three YouTube channels, one of them with 1.6 million subscribers, and one of the most listened to politics and culture podcasts. I've picked up a lot of tricks along the way, and I wish I could go back in time and give myself some of the advice in this video. If you want to start a YouTube channel, I can probably help. I'm going to walk you through the process of creating a great channel from the very beginning. By the end of this episode, you'll be ready to post your first video on your shiny new YouTube channel and start the new year off with a bang. So let's jump in. We're going to break this video down into four main categories. Concept, technical stuff, building the channel, and now what? There will be chapter markers below so you can come back and reference sections of this video again later. I'll also put some links in the description to videos I think are helpful for each category. Okay, you've made the decision that you want to be a YouTuber. My condolences. I'm kidding. Mostly. Before you do anything else, the single most important thing you need to ask yourself is why am I doing this? What is the purpose of my channel? It doesn't have to be anything super intense, you don't need to change the world, but you do need to have a really good idea of what your channel is about. Otherwise, you'll be confused and your audience will be confused, and those just aren't things you want. Say you want to make a gaming channel. First of all, good luck. That's the most saturated part of YouTube. But anyway, you want to make a gaming channel. What differentiates your channel from the rest? Will you focus on one kind of game? Are you a stand-up comedian who can make people laugh while you play? Or maybe you're just absolute garbage at video games. Find something that makes you stand out and lean into that. You're not just a gaming channel, you're a gaming channel that also does blank. That's the core concept of your channel, your elevator pitch. Do not go any further until you have your elevator pitch. So now that you've figured out what your channel's all about, you're going to need three more things before you can start making content. A name, a list of video ideas, and an understanding of your channel's style. Names are tough. They're super important, but they also don't really matter all that much. There are plenty of channels out there with really goofy names that rake in millions of views. What does matter is that you're still happy with the name five years down the line, because you really don't want to change your name and risk confusing your audience. Pick something that relates to your content, or use your name if you're comfortable with that. A lot of photography channels, vloggers, and personality-driven channels use the creator's name. Peter McKinnon, Natalie Lynn, Kyle McDougall. Super easy. Then you've got names relevant to the content. Jack Frags primarily plays shooters. Answer in Progress shows you the process of answering an interesting question. Real Engineering shows the actual science of engineering. There's not really any wrong answer here as long as you like the name, it's not already taken, and it's easily searchable. When I started my channel, I made the mistake of using a common phrase, second thought. That probably held me back a little bit. If you searched second thought on YouTube, you'd get song titles and dozens of random videos about, oh, this person had a second thought about blank. Don't stress about name choice too much, just make sure you're not shooting yourself in the foot. Next is video ideas. Having a cool channel concept is great, but the point of YouTube is to make videos, not have an empty channel. Open your Notes app or Google Docs and start a running list of ideas for content. At any given time, I've got between 10 and 30 video ideas I can pull from. I've typically found that passive idea generation is more productive than sitting down and forcing yourself to come up with something. Give it time. When something piques your interest, write it down. Soon enough, you'll have a long list of topics to cover. There's no such thing as a bad topic. It's just a matter of presenting the information well. If you're not on camera the whole time, or just showing gameplay, one thing to keep in mind during this stage of the process is how easy or difficult it'll be to find engaging visuals to cover the narration. A topic there's a lot of footage for will be way easier to produce than a video about a niche topic or an event that happened 200 years ago. That shouldn't be the sole determinant, you can always make a video work, but it's something to keep in mind, especially when you're just starting out. So get yourself a list together, maybe figure out which topic you want to tackle first, and then we can move on to the next step. Style. A lot of new creators overlook this step, and it's such a mistake. Video is obviously a visual medium. People are actively looking at what you're showing them. If you want to build a following, you need to make sure that you've got a nice presentation. There's a reason Second Thought is the largest channel in its category. It's because my team and I put a ton of work into making our content feel professional, engaging, and consistent. We went so far as to develop an actual style guide for the channel. That way, if we bring on a new editor, or we just need to refresh our memory on a certain motion graphic technique, we can refer back to the guide. 
You don't have to go that far, but having something like a mood board or a Google Doc where you keep style inspiration is a great idea. Colors, fonts, lighting, transitions, you should standardize as much as you possibly can both to make your job easier and get your audience accustomed to the channel's distinct style. That's how you get your content to stand out among a sea of amateur productions. And none of this has to be super fancy, it just needs to be intentional. Everything you show on screen should be there for a reason. The font should be chosen because it's your channel's default font, or because it fits a specific theme in the video, things like that. By developing your channel's style early, you'll save yourself a lot of headache in the long run. Okay, you got your idea, your name, a list of video ideas, and your style. Great job. Most people either don't make it this far, or they skip all that stuff and their channel never goes anywhere. By taking the time to build a strong foundation, you've got a leg up over 90% of new channels. Now we get to move on to the fun stuff. Production. This is the part that most people obsess over. Don't get me wrong, it's super important, but you can't salvage a bad script with a great recording. Each step builds on the previous one. Now, there are plenty of ways to make a YouTube video, but there are two main categories. Either you're on camera, or you're a disembodied voice. I've done both, they're both perfectly fine. But I will say that if you're looking to add a more personal touch to your videos, there's no substitute for being on camera. That being said, it's more work. So, what goes into production? First, some gear considerations. You'll need lighting, audio gear, and a camera. I listed the camera last because it's the least important. Most people would sooner watch a video with great audio and great lighting in 480p than a 4K video with garbage lighting and audio. Don't believe me? Let me show you. First, we'll slap together an amateur setup with bad lighting and audio directly from the camera mic, but shot on an expensive camera that shoots 8K. Looks terrible, sounds terrible. For most people, this is borderline unwatchable. No amount of money dumped into a nice expensive camera can salvage bad audio and bad lighting. So now, let's switch out this nice expensive camera for a phone, but with intentional lighting and good audio. See the difference? Good audio and lighting can make any camera shine, but bad audio and lighting can make even the most expensive camera useless. Don't splurge on the latest and greatest cameras without also considering lighting and audio. I don't even have a proper holder for this phone, it's just balanced on top of the camera. You don't need a fancy setup. Use your phone, get some good lights, get some good audio, and you're good. Okay, for the rest of the video, I'm going to assume you want to be on camera, simply because that's the more complicated approach. Let's take a look at a basic camera setup. Here's you, here's your camera, and here are your two lights. One of them is called your key light, that's the big light. And the other is called your fill light, which is generally less bright and sometimes a different color. These two lights are positioned at roughly 45 degree angles from the subject. You can go crazy and add all sorts of background lights and hair lights to help you stand out from the background, but it's not necessary. You can find really solid, affordable lighting kits online for like 80 bucks. I've put some examples down in the description. They don't have to be fancy, they just need to put a nice diffused light on you. Just so you know what you don't want, here's what it looks like when you don't use some kind of diffusion. The light is harsh and it creates really stark shadows. Not very flattering. There's a time and place for it, but that's a topic for another video. A good rule of thumb is no bare bulbs, and make sure you've got an umbrella or softbox to diffuse the light. Another thing to take into account is your location. What's in the background? You really only need one presentable wall. The rest of the room can be a jumble of cables and camera gear. For years, I worked out of a 10x10 converted bedroom, and just out of frame was a mess of tripods, light stands, clamps, cables, and all manner of other junk. And I've got over a million subs. I promise you don't need a Hollywood set. Just make sure your background is fairly clean and undistracting. Next up is audio. There is no better way to lose a viewer than to have bad audio. Thankfully, there are plenty of ways to capture good audio. The easiest acceptable way would probably be to get a lavalier mic that plugs directly into your phone. Or heck, a lot of YouTubers have taken to just clipping a Rode or DJI mic capsule directly to their shirt. It's less quote unquote professional, but it's very normal these days. Either way, you can then sync your audio and video in post. It's not hard. Just make sure you clap when you start recording so you can line up the audio peaks. Another option would be something like a Rode video mic. This is a small shotgun mic that plugs directly into your camera. This works great if you're fairly close to the camera, but if you're further away or if your room is echoey, the sound quality will suffer. The next step up, and what I used for the first few years of my channel, was a portable audio recorder with a shotgun mic attachment. I used the Zoom H5 and their proprietary shotgun. 
stick it on a tripod, point it in the general direction of your face, set the levels, and you're good to go. The final step would be to get a professional shotgun mic and run it into your audio recorder via an XLR cable. This will give you the best quality sound. You can get fairly inexpensive boom arms for your mic online. You just want to get it as close as you can without it being in frame. Links to what I use and some more budget-friendly suggestions in the description. Now, since I'm sure you all want to know about cameras, I'll cover it very briefly. But again, spend your money on lighting and audio gear first. Most cameras, including phones, shoot pretty good video these days. Give them a well-lit scene and they'll all look great. At the moment, I use a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K for my sit-down stuff, and usually a DJI Osmo Pocket 3 for handheld. The Blackmagic is great because I can record directly to an SSD, which means I never have to worry about running out of recording space, and I can edit directly off the drive if I want to. As for what I'd recommend for beginners, I'd probably go with a Canon or Sony mirrorless. They're small, easy to use, and you can swap the lenses for different applications. The lens is what really determines the look you're going to get from the camera. If your room is deep enough for it, something like a 50mm f1.8 equivalent, the actual number will vary depending on whether you get a full frame or crop sensor camera, is going to give you that nice soft background if that's what you're going for. For most of my sit down stuff, I use a Sigma 18 35 f1.8. The Osmo is new. I got it mostly to record family and travel stuff, but it's actually a really capable little camera. It shoots 4K log if you want to color grade the footage, and it's got a ton of useful features like horizon lock for nice level moving shots, and subject tracking for when you need to record yourself moving around. What held the Osmo back in the past was the sensor size. The footage just wasn't any better than what you could get from a phone. But this new one has a larger 1 inch sensor, so the quality is much improved, and the low light capabilities are surprisingly good. This is a great little camera for travel or vlogging or anything like that. I've left a list of great camera review channels in the description. Definitely do your research before you buy one. There's a lot to learn. Take a look, see what looks good and what fits your budget, and remember, you can absolutely start with just your phone. Okay, one quick word about editing software. You can use pretty much whatever you want. Some options are just more full-featured than others. I learned on Adobe Premiere, but Final Cut and DaVinci Resolve are both great options. In fact, if you're brand new to editing, I might suggest starting with Resolve. It's quickly become the industry standard for color grading, and it just keeps getting better with each update. But more importantly, you can buy it. I can't even begin to estimate how many thousands of dollars I've spent on the stupid Adobe Creative Cloud subscription over the years for buggy software with zero customer support. There's even a free version of Resolve that's good enough for 99% of new channels. And the full version comes free when you buy any Blackmagic camera. Whatever you choose, there are plenty of YouTube channels dedicated to teaching you how to use the software. Take the time to learn the basics, and you'll be cutting like a champ in no time. So, now you know everything there is to know about video production. Not really, but you know enough. Now comes the part where a lot of people start to second guess themselves. Actually making the channel. You're prepared though, you've got this. The one good thing about Google owning the entire internet is that making a YouTube channel is super easy. You can use a personal Gmail to create your channel, but what I'd recommend is creating a new Gmail account that you'll associate with your channel. What I've always done is take the channel name, for example, Second Thought, and slap the word channel at the end. And that's usually not taken. So make your Gmail account, then head over to YouTube and sign in using that account. Click your profile picture at the top right corner of the screen, and then select Create a Channel, and then plug in your channel's name. Next up is Channel Art, Info, and Links. You need a profile picture, a banner, a channel description, and any links you want to plug. For your profile picture, try to use something that stands out, or at least is very clear what it is. Remember, these pictures are tiny, and most people see them on their phone. If you're making a personality-driven channel, probably use a picture of yourself. Otherwise, show something related to your brand, like a logo. This image should be somewhere around 800 by 800 pixels. The channel art thing is a little more confusing. Basically, this image will be displayed differently depending on what device is being used to view your channel. Google recommends 2560 by 1440 pixels, and only a portion of that will be visible to your viewers. It's really annoying to guesstimate what will look good, so I'd recommend downloading a YouTube banner template or using an online tool to help you design the perfect layout. As for what goes on the banner, that's up to you. Just make sure it captures what your channel is about. Maybe a few words about your channel, or a picture of you in your studio, or a stylized version of your channel name, or your upload schedule, or any combination of these things. There's no wrong answer as long as it looks polished and intentional. 
Next is the text part of your channel. You've got your description and your links. Tell the audience a little bit about who you are, what you do, when you upload, that sort of thing. This can be as short or as long as you like. Personally, I generally think shorter is better, but go nuts. Links are pretty straightforward. Have a Twitter account for the channel? Drop it here. Patreon? Same thing. You can also take a few minutes to pick your upload defaults. This is super useful if you know you'll always want to include certain information in your video descriptions. It saves a surprising amount of time not having to type it out for every upload. And with that, congratulations! Your channel is officially ready to go. But we're not done yet. First off, if you've made it this far, congratulations. The majority of people are scared off by the time you mention channel art dimensions. But if you stuck around, you're in luck. This is where most how-to videos stop, and that's really unhelpful, because what comes after you've made your channel is the most important stuff. It's time for YouTube Bootcamp, the grunt work that will determine whether your channel flops or flies. We're talking upload schedule, analytics, how to make a proper sacrifice to the algorithm, the nitty gritty of getting eyeballs on your work. Let's start with your upload schedule. We're shooting for quality over quantity, but on YouTube, unfortunately, the quantity matters too, at least at first. I'm gonna challenge you to post once a week for the first year. That's 52 videos. If you can show the audience you post quality content on a consistent schedule, they are way more likely to stick around and watch more. If you only upload occasionally and on a random schedule, no one will know when to expect your next video, and they'll forget about you between uploads. Speaking from personal experience, pretty much every successful channel I know started with one video per week. Some of us started with two per week, but the problem at that point is that quality begins to suffer. In my opinion, one per week is the sweet spot for new channels. As your subscriber count grows, dialing it back to once every two weeks is usually a good call, if it will help you produce better content and you're in a category where that makes sense. Video essays, absolutely. Gaming, not so much. Now we need to talk about the harsh reality of YouTube. It's really hard to build a successful channel. A lot of us in the education category rose to relative prominence in what we call the second wave of big channels. First, there were channels like CGP Grey, Kurtzgesagt, Minute Earth. And then after that, you had channels like mine, Real Life Lore, Wendover Productions, and Real Engineering. Since then, I don't know that there's been a wave of channel growth quite like the first two. There are a lot more people on the platform, especially since the pandemic. And the algorithm always seems to be changing in order to favor different kinds of content. I know a few people at YouTube, and as much as they say that the algorithm is impartial or fair or completely logical, I think we all know that's not actually the case. It prioritizes channels and content that make the platform money. And hey, that makes sense. It's a corporate behemoth. But that also means you need to take YouTube's recommendations and advice with a grain of salt. The only surefire way I've seen to build a channel, a method that has remained the same since the beginning, is to produce content that you care about. Be genuine about it. Avoid topics that will get your videos age restricted and stick to a consistent upload schedule. Those are the only pieces of advice I can say for certain will help your channel grow. The rest comes down to patience, advertising, and honestly, a whole lot of luck. Okay, this video is already getting pretty long, so here are some other useful tips and tricks in no particular order. If you're on camera, get a teleprompter. This little thing is literally the only way I've been able to get through my on-camera narration. I'm using it right now. You load your script into an app like PromptSmart, slap your phone in the holder, and slot the prompter onto an adapter ring on your camera lens. It's probably the single most useful piece of production gear for talking head setups. Get a teleprompter. You won't regret it. Don't let the last 10 videos ranking get you down. In your YouTube studio, once you've uploaded 10 videos, you'll get this little tool that ranks the performance of your last 10 uploads. If your most recent video is outperforming the others, you get a nice little green up arrow. If it's underperforming, you get a sad little gray down arrow. It sounds silly, but when you see that gray arrow and a 10th place ranking, it really sucks. You start dreading the first half hour after your video goes live, because as soon as the clock hits 30 minutes, you get your report card. And it's always the videos you think are gonna do well that come out dead last. And when you get a few weeks of poor performance in a row, it's really easy to spiral and assume this is the end for your channel. Take a breath, go touch grass, and step away from the screen for a bit. If you produced a video you're proud of, you did your part. The rest comes down to whether the algorithm puts it in front of a receptive audience. Run your gear off mains power whenever possible. The number of times I've had a monitor, camera, or audio recorder die on me is frankly embarrassing. If you're shooting in a room with outlets, use them. Your camera probably came with an AC adapter, and you can find generic options for most other devices online. 
The Zoom H5 in particular devours batteries, so save yourself the headache and plug it in so you never have to worry about running out of power. If you have oily skin or your face tends to sweat, pick up some HD powder. It's just a simple matte powder to keep your skin from looking shiny on camera. This is a super cheap fix for a pretty common problem, and it looks way better to have a nice, smooth, matte finish on your talent than to have big, distracting hotspots. If you use a lavalier mic, pick up some of these little sticky guys and these tiny wind covers. With this combo, you can mic up your talent without showing the little vampire clip, and the fuzzy cover will cut wind noise if you're outside. Looks better, sounds better, super cheap. Make backups of everything. Have a critical project file? Save a copy on another drive. Have a bunch of footage from an on-location shoot? Duplicate your hard drives because something will go wrong. This goes double if you're traveling. Make a copy every night after you're finished shooting. And if you're traveling with a team, give the copied drives to someone else so that if you lose yours or they lose theirs, you've still got your footage. Charge literally everything after every shoot. It sucks to get all prepped to shoot only to turn on your lavalier and realize it's on 10% battery. If you get in the habit of keeping everything charged, you'll never have to sit around for an hour while you get up to a usable battery level. Just like with your files, redundancy is critical. If you've ever heard the expression, one is none, this is one of those situations. I've had a talent go home still wearing our lavalier halfway through a shoot day when I needed it for another interview. When I was shooting in the Marshall Islands, the outlets ran hot, I had four bulbs for our cheap travel lighting kit, and three of them blew up. I had a zoom fall into the ocean. Wherever you can afford to have backups for critical gear, do it. It's a heck of a lot cheaper to spend an extra 300 bucks on a decent lavalier than to book another flight back out to wherever you were shooting, or trying to overnight a piece of camera gear to a remote location. And my last piece of advice, for now, I'm sure I'll do more of these, is to have fun with it. If you don't enjoy what you do, what's the point? Work hard, but not so hard that you burn out. Produce good videos, but not so good that you don't have time for friends and family. Stick to your upload schedule, but if something comes up, it's okay to miss an episode here and there. YouTube is as much an art as it is a science. Do what you're passionate about, and people will see that passion and want to experience it with you. All right, that's all I've got for you. Go on, get out of here, go build your new channel, and make something that you're proud of.